Welcome to Growing Through Tragedy, Experiencing Life's Challenges from an Empowered Perspective. This is Leon Morton. Between stimulus and response, there is a space, and in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. That quote by Viktor Frankl, the Austrian neurologist and psychiatrist Holocaust survivor. It is our hope that this resource provides you an opportunity to have a different perspective as you're going through life's challenges so that you can choose your response and in that response by your growth and your freedom. As we continue the series on Diary of a Suicide Loss Survivor, in the last episode, I shared the interesting scenario I had when I was trying to find resources to help support me as I was going to grow through this process. 10-17-2014 I so badly wanted to stay in bed today. My mind was swimming with thoughts of Kristen all night and I had very rough sleepless time. I went to an SOS support group this week. It was amazing to hear the devastation of other families and people, and it was an eye-opener for me. One of the things I took away from that meeting was that it seems that we all will have, whether consciously or unconsciously, create a narrative of what has happened around the situation particularly as it relates to suicide loss and and being left behind. Today outside, it's cloudy and, and overcast, and today on my inside is the same. The memories and the mental movie that I continue in my head about finding her on the night that she killed herself has been on my mind in my sleep and in my waking moments. Horrible memories. I was supposed to have her as my wife, my lover, and my friend for 45 more years, feeling cheated and robbed at this time. The expectations that I had are hard to suppress and keep down. Our dreams, our plans, our goals, all gone just like dust, the same as she lays now in her new urn, dust. Last week, the sleeplessness increased from constant internal communication in my dreams. Nothing elaborate or specific, mostly just, why, honey? Why did you have to leave? Why did you do this to me? And these questions just continued to play through my mind. We got her a beautiful urn. It was a piece of art, and I was able to put her remains in it. I did this alone as I wanted it to be just her and I. And when I did, I opened a bottle of wine that we had saved from our wedding. We made wine for our guests and we saved five bottles for our first five years. I opened up one of the last bottles, poured a glass of wine, sprinkled some of her into it, and drank her down into me. So that entry is uh, moving. The thing I want to really discuss is what I got out of that very first meeting, which was how we all create a narrative. And we do this unconsciously, or we're going to be able to do it consciously. So in a position where somebody has gone through a suicide loss and they're, they're left here, they're the ones that are here, it gets beyond the typical five stages of bereavement or grief. And just to touch on those quickly, you can expect to move through these emotions and these mental places as you're questioning what's gone on or how are you going to move forward. Please note that you don't go through these in order necessarily, but there are there are distinguishing stages that have been identified, and those are denial, which includes then isolation, anger, bargaining, 
depression, and then acceptance. Now that's the standard five stages of bereavement and grief. And as we've discussed, suicide loss is completely different. Suicide loss adds much more into that. Let's just touch on those five. Denial. (laughs) Denial, obviously, the shock and the denial, like no way is this true. Also, isolation comes in that stage of denial where you may feel like you don't want to be around anybody. You need to be alone. You need to be by yourself. Anger comes. Anger becomes very real in this process. You can be angry at yourself, particularly that you didn't see it, that you couldn't have done something different, you know, whatever that thing might be as you're running that through in your head. The interesting thing that I found in this situation was the anger that I had towards her in doing this. And then I get angry at myself because I was being mad at her when I love her. I didn't, I don't want to be mad. I don't want that anger. I found that interesting. Bargaining. I spoke with others that are in the same position. And we're going to, in the future episodes here, we're going to be reading and interviewing other people. And learning from their story as well. But one of the interesting things I found is bargaining becomes a real thing. Like, please, God, anything. Just bring her back. I'll do anything. Or or the bargaining of if only I could have or if only I would have. And what's going on there is your mind is just trying to make sense of this process and to deal with this pain. And in that bargaining, it becomes the next step where it kind of lessens the reactiveness in the situation. Depression obviously sets in, and in the depression stage, worry can become very cumbersome. You worry, what do you mean worry? Worry about what? Well, you might worry about all the bills that might be coming in now, costs associated with the funeral services, Uh, maybe there were some medical bills involved, practical things like that become a stressor, and then in the depression stage, those things also become real. And then... Ultimately, hopefully, it moves on to acceptance over time. The acceptance isn't necessarily you accept it as though you agree with it, but what happens is you simply accept where you are now, and you also identify through the narration of what you've made this story mean, you accept where it is you're going from this point forward. And again, these those five stages, you're going to move through them and it's not necessarily fluid. Now, the difference in suicide loss, which is also just something that we all have to address here, is you'll have guilt, addition to the five, you're going to have incredible guilt. You're going to go through incredible confusion because your mind's going to want to try to make sense of this. You're going to go through rejection. You're going to feel shame You're going to feel anger at yourself directly, as I expressed, and also anger at the loved one. And that can be really hard to deal with. You also have stigma and trauma in addition to abandonment. And these are all scientifically identified stages that are added on, piled on, when we're talking specifically about suicide loss survivor. So let's just touch on those really quickly. Guilt. Again, I think we already addressed it in an earlier episode, but you are not omnipotent, you're not omniscient, and you're not a mind reader. Yet, your mind is going to bring things to your thought process where you're going to be thinking, I could have done, I should have done, what if I'd have done this? And you can assume guilt in that space, but please do not do that. It isn't your fault. You don't choose another person's behavior. You don't choose another person's actions. You don't choose another person's choices. So you can't take ownership of that. Confusion is real. And you will be confused. And that's literally just your mind trying to make sense of this thing. And sometimes you're just going to have to come to it that there's no sense in it. Rejection and shame. I dealt with this personally and I felt rejected, so rejected that she would do this. And that's me, you know, from my personal space going, what the hell? But, But those were real feelings that I had to just let come and then let go 
you don't hold on to these things. And what I want people to get out of this and my story is, listen, if you can hear some of the shit that goes down, then maybe when it happens to you, you'll have a better awareness and you can say, oh, this is what he was talking about. Yeah, I am feeling that right now. And it can help you have better choices in your reactiveness. Shame and stigma and the trauma. And yes, I dealt with those for sure. Um, shame and the stigma was really interesting as I observed it in myself. I didn't want to tell anybody what really happened. Like I even debated maybe I should just make up a lie and say she got in a car accident. Why would I do that? Well, there's lots of reasons. There is a stigma around suicide. And it's a real thing. One of the most recent um, science studies talks about this stigma. And this is from the National Institute of Health. And it says that unlike other modes of death, suicide is stigmatized. And even though we have attempted and valiant strides have been made to address mental illness and suicide in particular, many bereaved individuals report that it can be difficult to talk to others about their loss because others often feel uncomfortable talking with or dealing with the topic of suicide. In addition, it goes on in this report to then address the religious stigmas that are involved with suicide. And many then are left vulnerable and unable to even go to their place of faith because those places have a bunch of weird thoughts around people that, that commit suicide or that choose that. And I can tell you personally, I received messages from people that found out. And again, I didn't even tell people. I didn't talk about it at all. I, I didn't really address how she passed. But I would receive messages from people, and this is no, no bullshit, where they would be like, well, do you think she's in heaven? Do you think she's in hell? I mean, it was obnoxious messages from people, and I felt that was very invasive. I was very frustrated with that type of communication. I didn't uh, engage in it at all, but I just let it go. And, you know, it became clear to me after the fact, as I look back on it, that there is a pretty severe stigma in the space. And so because of that, that also makes dealing with suicide loss a unique situation, far more than typical bereavement. So if that happens to you, you can feel comfortable that, well, hey, you're not alone because it's, it happens to almost all of us that go through this process. It's very important, and the takeaway for today's episode is going to be one of the first things, one of the first implementing tactics that you can use now to help yourself. In this, you want to become an observer of your thoughts. And I'm going to share with you a practice that I put into play, and it became very empowering for me. Now, we're going to address two specific things to implement right away. And again, the last episode was step one. So step one is to get professional help. If you do feel stigma, if you do feel shame, if you do feel like you can't talk to somebody, which is what the science studies prove, then that should be enough for you to know, I got to go out and get help, just like I expressed in the last episode. Step one is to get some professional help, and there are plenty of resources now, so please take advantage of that. The next step is addressing this creation of the narrative that a person that goes through this experience does. Now, they do it consciously or unconsciously, so we want to do it consciously, and what that means is you need to create your own story of the meaning of what this experience is to you. And I encourage you to do it in a way that is loving, kind, self-loving for you, and empowering. And I'll tell you exactly how I did it. And this is the first thing to implement, is create the story. And the story may already be created in your mind. 
that's okay. My, my story was very challenged initially too, and I recreated it. What I mean by that is I literally wrote down the things that I wanted to be the meaning of my relationship with my wife and what that love was to me, what her love was to me, and what this experience was going to mean for me from this moment forward. And that's really the only thing we can control in life is the choosing of what things mean to us. And from that moment forward, it does dictate then the way that we perceive our world. So I highly encourage you step to take this step of action. Write down some incredible things that you're grateful for about the relationship with this person. I want you to, to really put some thought to this and come up with a compelling story of love and affection around this individual in your life and then what this means. So it sounds something like this. Initially, in the first multiple weeks, my story could have easily gone to blame, anger, me being the victim, right? Just like the diary episode, how could she do this to me? These kinds of things. And that story was starting to become real. <laughs> Instead, I made a conscious effort to change the story. And my story particularly sounds like my beautiful wife came to me when I needed her in life. When I needed to learn to trust love again, she came. She was there. And I did trust love with her, and we had an incredible experience together. And that I was there for her in a time when she truly needed a man to honor and support her in a loving and kind way, which I did. Of course, would I have loved our situation and our time together to be far more? Yes, absolutely. But I am grateful for the time that I had with her. And I recognize many people go through an entire life of a loving relationship and never even get close to the depth of experience that I had with Kristen. And I am so grateful that she was in my world. And I was so grateful that she was my wife and that I could have that love with her. That's what my story became. I created that story. I continued to condition it to myself. I told it to two or three friends that I trusted so that when I was struggling, I could go to them and they could say, hey, buddy, <laughs> no, that bullshit is not real. It wasn't you. You didn't know. You couldn't have been. Here, let me remind you what your story is. Your story is an incredible story of love with a woman who loved you and who you loved dearly. And you're so lucky that you had that experience because many never do. So that becomes so empowering when you can do that. It literally changed the game for me. The second thing that we'll implement in this uh, episode is now that we've created that narrative and I highly encourage you to create your own story and make it powerful, make it empowering for you because you're the one that's here. You're, you're still here. You got to go forward. Make the story empowering to you. And then secondly, start to implement that story through your thought process and as you start to watch and continue to see your experience, you're going to be going through all these emotional stages that we've been discussing. Try to put your play, yourself in a place where you can become the observer of yourself in this space. And when I did this, it literally changed my complete perspective. Now, it didn't mean that everything was easy as I was going through this, but it did make it more clear for me that I was going to be able to get through it and be able to get through it in an empowered way if I just stay the course. And what I mean by that is it dawned on me one day because I woke up, I came out into the main room, living room, and I looked at a picture of Kristen and I broke down just violently weeping and the pain was so strong and it was so powerful it just took over like a wave just engulfed me 
And I remember just sobbing and heaving and then thinking about me as though I'm watching myself sobbing and heaving in this moment. And I was okay to be in it. Like I, it was odd, but I was observing myself having the experience as opposed to allowing myself to be swept up in the experience. This is a technique that is called mindfulness. And it is incredibly powerful to implement in the process of this type of recovery. So not to get anybody all weirded out, mindfulness you know, it's very popular now and people confuse it with lots of things. Some people think it's all, you know, ethereal where we're going to harmonize our energies with the moon and the stars and that kind of thing. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is becoming the observer of your thoughts and your emotions. And by doing that, that in and of itself creates a buffer of your reactiveness in the experience. And the better you get at it, the better it becomes for you. So for example, when I figured, when it hit me like that, that wow, I am in just incredible pain right now. I'm grieving the loss of my wife and I'm heaving and sobbing. And you know what? It's okay. <laughs> Because that's part of the process. And it was almost like I looked at myself from outside of myself being in this emotional hurt. And it was almost empathetic. And that was really moving for me. And, and I'll tell you this too. Then what happens is you allow yourself to go through those moments, but you don't, have, you don't attach a bunch of different meaning to it. Because it's just literally a, an emotion that you're moving through. So in regards to mindfulness, and we'll do a short practice of it here to finish the session today, but I have a whole program available for mindfulness. But the thing that we need to take out of it for this specific instance is this. You are not going to be able to stop your mind of these crazy-ass thoughts that are coming. You are not going to be able to just clear your mind and have no thought. And that's not even the goal. The goal is to just be the observer of the emotions and thoughts as they come. Literally visualize it like a wave at the ocean. A negative or bad thought comes, it moves over you, and then it goes. And this is exactly how it does work, and I'll prove it to you right now. Take a second and predict for me your very next thought, which you cannot do, but you did have a thought. Maybe that thought was, what the hell is he talking about? Maybe that thought was, well, yeah, I make my own thoughts, but, but you didn't create that next thought. The thoughts come and the thoughts go. And in grief and bereavement, there's a thing called rumination. And you can be stuck in that. And you don't want to. So one of the ways to defeat that is to become the observer of the thoughts without attaching meaning or ownership to it. The thoughts and these emotions are just going to come and they're going to go. And the more you can put yourself in a place of observing that and literally just be the watcher, and let those things pass without attaching meaning, you become stronger in your mind and in your brain and in your neurology. Literally, you'll be rewiring your brain towards a more empowered outcome. So let's practice that as we wrap up this session today. Literally, simple and easy. We don't, you are not trying to do anything with your thoughts except for just follow this little illustration that I'm going to walk you through. Take a deep breath in through your nose, out through the mouth, and just allow your body to sit for a minute in this place of pain and chaos and, and wondering and questioning. Just, just sit for a second and just let your body breathe. And for the next three breaths, do nothing more than focus on your body breathing. 
One easy way to do that is on the inhale, count the number one and focus on how the breath maybe comes in through your nostrils or in through your mouth and as your chest or your abdomen rises and then on the exhale say the number one inside your mind again all the way to when the breath stops and literally just put your focus on the breath perfect now continue to breathe gently for a few more breaths and the minute a thought pops into your mind just literally observe it like, oh, that was an interesting thought. And then let the thought go and redirect your attention back to the process of your body breathing. For sure you're going to have another thought. Maybe you'll have four or five come at you instantly, and that's okay. Those are just thoughts. Let them come. Let them go. And then redirect your mind back to focusing on the breathing that's it that's as simple as it is now I recommend you do this process for five minutes and then in, in lengthen that to ten minutes when you can you can do it in as short as one minute and the more you do it throughout the day the more powerful it will become for you in addition, you will get some stress relief response from it. And we're going to go through a bunch of those processes in further episodes. But uh, just in the process of getting started, literally, you just take a pause and you direct your mind and your focus to your breathing. And when you're interrupted and disrupted by a thought, you just observe that that was a thought. You let that thought go without attaching emotion to it. And you redirect your brain and your mind back to the focus on the process of your body breathing. What happens when you do this is twofold. First of all, you're creating new neural pathways that train your imagination and they hone your attention and focus. And that's incredibly powerful. Secondly, it's been proven that literally with over 100 cumulative minutes of this type of practice, that your brain physically changes into a more empowered state, which gives you better executive functioning skills, which means that you have better choices in how you react to thoughts and emotions. And this is going to become very powerful for us as we move through this process of growing through tragedy. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you in the next episode. In the upcoming episodes, you will learn specific mental strategies and specific tools to implement to help cope in a tragedy of this sort. Many of these techniques are able to be used in a broad variety of life's situations and challenges, and we encourage you to utilize them wherever you see fit, where it can be helpful to you. If you are in a current situation of emergency or tragedy or deep loss and you're struggling, we encourage you to get professional help right away. We encourage you to get plugged in. There's a Growing Through Tragedy Facebook page. You're welcome to join that, share your stories, learn from others that have gone through incredible hardships and how they've done it. And if these episodes are of value to you, please subscribe to the podcast and also please forward it to anybody that you know that might be struggling and could benefit from these stories and information. We appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Growing Through Tragedy series brought to you by the Belief Hack Brainery.